I have a friend who I would tell her to her face, and I have told her to her face that she is a loud mouth. <laughs> That's what she is. She's a, she's a loud mouth. Uh, she talks all the time, incessantly. Uh, when she calls you on the phone, uh, you get in very few words in the, in the midst of that 30 or 45 minute conversation. And it's not just in one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship. She is a, she's a loud mouth when it comes to groups of people. She's the kind of person that will say things that, that you cringe, that make you cringe. Maybe they are just a little bit crass. Maybe they are just a little bit out there. But whatever the case, she is always, always bold. She is always, always bold. And oftentimes, whenever I cringe when I'm around her, it's not necessarily because what she's saying makes me cringe. I am cringing on her behalf. <laughs> that is, that's so very much unlike my personality. My personality is to stand in the background. Um, my personality is to stand over in the corner, not to be looked at at all, and not, not necessarily to be one that is, is, is always leading, leading out front, at least in that kind of way. Well, Peter was a very similar personality type. Peter was the one as well who was, who was always very bold, always very outspoken. And I, I, I suspect that sometimes when he spoke up, the other disciples cringed just a little bit. Not, not necessarily at what he said, but they were cringing for him. For he was always, it seems, always kind of stepping outside and, and being the very, the very first one. He would have been known as an, as an early adopter. You know, the early adopters are those that have the iPhone 11 at the very first. The, I, the, the, the early adopters are the ones that have the latest, not just technology, but they're the ones to grab on to the earliest idea, to the ideas the very earliest. They're always kind of out front leading the crowd. Well, I would, have, I would, I would describe Peter that way. He was an early, he was an early adopter. Peter was, he was, he was the very, he was, well, he was the, really the self-appointed spokesperson of the disciples. When Jesus told a parable that the rest of the disciples, they didn't understand, Peter was the one that would always ask him, Lord, explain this to us. We don't understand. The other disciples were, were a little bit too fearful to, even, to really even approach Jesus in that way. Peter, Peter was, was, was the one. When, when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? Do you remember what the, other, what the disciples said? There were some disciples, and they, they seemed to be pretty unsure of themselves, by the way. Who do people say, say that I am? Well, you know, we're not quite sure, Jesus. And now, some people say that you may be Elijah, but now, we, now we're not necessarily saying that. We're not exactly sure. Others said, well, you know, some people, now some people say that you are John the Baptist, come back from the dead, but we're, we're just not sure. Do you remember? It was Peter. Peter said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The very first time that any of his disciples had ever said something quite like that, it was Peter. It was Peter that said, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. On the night in which he was betrayed and arrested, he was telling his disciples what was about to happen to, to, to him. Jesus told his disciples, um, I won't be with you very much longer, but I, t t later I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to suffer for you, I'm going to be arrested, and I'm eventually, I'm eventually going to be put to death. And the rest of the disciples, they said, oh, no, no, Lord, it cannot be. Do you remember what Peter said? Peter said, Jesus, I'll go to my death for you. It was Peter. And here in our story today, no doubt, no doubt it is Peter leading the way. Today we're continuing our, this look at these so-called children's stories, these stories that many of us grew up uh, learning and listening to someone tell us these stories using a, using a flannel board or using a felt board. And these are stories that oftentimes, again, we look at them as children's stories. These are stories that are in children's Bibles. 
These are stories that are, again, are, are told to children because they, they capture our imagination. And indeed, there is so much in this story that really, really captures our imagination. Um, however, I believe, and what we have found is that these stories that we often look at, like children's stories, they have deep, deep theological meaning and purpose in our lives, and I believe certainly continue to have those same kinds of meaning and purpose in our, in our lives today. So again, this story takes place just after, immediately after Jesus is fed the 5,000. Now again, that's a little bit of a misnomer. It was more than 5,000. The gospel accounts describe it as there were 5,000 men in attendance, plus women and children. Uh, most scholars believe it was at least 15,000 people that Jesus and his disciples fed. And, and, and we're going to look at that story next week. But, but very briefly, Jesus fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. It wasn't just because people started sharing. Now, there are some that said it was the miracle because people started sharing. No, it was indeed a miracle performed by Jesus. And those five loaves of bread and those two fish, they multiplied and they fed the crowd. And so they had been around a crowd of, of, of at least 15,000 for a number of hours and they were absolutely exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And so the end of that evening after they had gathered up the 12 leftover baskets full of food from just five loaves of bread and, and two fish, Jesus sent his disciples to the other side of the lake. Now, again, we've looked at the Sea of Galilee. It really isn't really a sea. It is a, it is a large lake about seven and a half miles east and west and 13 to 14 miles north and south. And so Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat. Now, it doesn't say get into a boat, or it doesn't say uh, he didn't say go find a boat. He says get into the boat implying that that was their, their normal mode of uh, transportation when they were there around the Sea of Galilee. More than likely, it would have been uh, Peter or Andrew or uh, James and John's boat or one of their father's boats. Some, so it, was some, it was likely one of the disciples' boat, and it was their primary means of transportation. So he told them to get into the boat, and he would, come, uh, he would meet them on the other side of of the lake, and he went up to the mountainside, and he began to pray by himself. Now, this journey across across the Sea of Galilee should have been a, by boat. It should have. It really should not have taken all that long. It likely would have taken uh, four, or five, possibly six hours, maybe up to six hours. If the weather was beautiful, uh, the the disciples likely would not have had to row hardly at all. They just simply would have list, lifted the sail and the wind would have taken them to the other side of the lake. But as we examined a couple of weeks ago, the Sea of Galilee is a fascinating, a fascinating body of water. One, it's below sea level. It's one of the, the few um, pieces of or the, the few uh, uh, pieces of, of water that, that's b below sea level. And so it, it, it also is pretty salty. It's not near as low as the Sea of Galilee. The other thing that's fascinating about the Sea of Galilee is because that it is surrounded by uh, mountains on both sides, that, that air, it cools on the way up, and then, or it re really, on the eastern side, it, it becomes very hot, blowing over those, those, very, um, those very, very uh, arid mountains. And so that the, the air becomes very hot, and that's normally not what happens when it goes over mountains, but here it is, it becomes hot, and then it comes over the Sea of Galilee, and that, that cool air coming off of the Sea of Galilee begins to swirl with all of that very warm air, and it, be, and, and it creates really dangerous storms on the Sea of Galilee. And so the disciples, it appears as though, the disciples ran into one of those storms in the Sea of Galilee. The New International Version, if we, let me, let me go ahead and, and, the, and, read, and read the rest of this story. Beginning in, I'll go ahead and begin in verse 22. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side 
while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was alone there. But the boat by this time was a long way away from the land, beaten by the wave, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth night of the watch, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, what in the world is the fourth night of the watch? Well, according to Roman thought at that time, it was um, there were four watches in the night. And the fourth watch of the night was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It was the last watch of the night. So very likely they had been on the Sea of Galilee uh, uh, maybe around nine hours. And the, and the, and the scripture says that they were only, well, in, in um, Mark and John's gospel, uh, it says that they were only a halfway across of the Sea of Galilee. They had only gotten uh, just over three miles, with over just over three and a half miles, about three and three and three quarters miles or so, they had only traveled that far in nine hours. That tells you how strong of a storm it was. The entire trip across the the lake should have taken them four or five hours tops, and they were into this thing already six or seven hours, and they were, they were only halfway there. That tells you how large of a storm. It was, and uh, even in, but even in the midst of the storm, they looked out and they saw, they thought it was a ghost. And by the way, I would guess if you and I were in their same, uh, same positions, we too might think it was a ghost. These were, these were fishermen. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they had been raised on this very sea of Galilee. They knew this lake like the back of their hand. They knew the best fishing holes. They knew the best, uh, the, the best places to, uh, to dock. They knew the best places to, uh, to, 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 to push off from, from the land. They knew this lake by the back of their hand. And I can promise you they saw lots of disasters on this sea. They saw lots of storms out in the middle of this lake. They likely saw lots of men be thrown overboard, and they even likely saw a lot of people drown in the middle of this lake. And so they knew the dangers of this water, no doubt. And they they saw something on the horizon, and they couldn't wrap their minds around it, and they said, oh, well, it obviously is a ghost, or it's a mirage, or something. And so they said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come to me. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately, immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When we tell this story to children, When we tell this story to children, we almost always focus on this scene right here. The failure of Peter's faith. I mean, how could he how could he how could he doubt Jesus that much, we think? He was an absolute failure in his faith. But I think, I think there were eleven larger failures sitting in that boat. Peter didn't have a failure of faith. Peter got out of the boat. Again, remember who he is. He's not one that hadn't been around water before. He is not one that had never seen someone drown on these very waters. No, he was a fisherman. He knew exactly the the threat of that water. Can you imagine how white-knuckled he was? when he first threw his leg over the side of that boat and then threw his other leg over the side of the boat, can you imagine how tightly he was gripping onto the edge of that boat before he dropped down onto that water? Thinking to himself, surely, surely, Lord, I'm not going to make it through this. 
Surely, Lord, I'm going to sink very, I'm going to sink all the way down. Well, Lord, at least I know how to swim. At least I can do this on my own. If all else fails, God, I can, I can tread water myself. But I know he was white-knuckled. And why do I know? Because I've been there myself. I've been there myself. Afraid to get out of the boat. It was a popular book written about 20 years ago. The title of the book was, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. I think the point of this story, or at least the point of the story that I've been thinking about this week, is not Peter's failure of faith. It is Peter's, um, Peter's incredible faithfulness by getting out of the boat. I think part of the story is, is what kept the rest of the people in the boat. And so I asked that to myself, what in the world keeps me in the boat? Well, I know in my life there are a number of things that keep me in the boat. And one of those things is comfort. I love my comfortable life. Over the years, I've loved my comfortable pews. Over the years, I've loved my comfortable house that the, that the church provides for me. I love my comfortable life. And because of that, often I'm, I'm so fearful of getting out of the boat because I don't want to give up my comfort. I don't want to give up this life of ease. I don't want to give up the comfort of my surroundings of this boat. No, no doubt, no doubt, the, the other 11 disciples, they saw the waves and the wind from that boat, but they said, Oh, better to, better to withstand the waves and the wind inside the boat than outside the boat. Way more comfortable inside the boat. I also oftentimes have a fear of the unknown, deathly afraid of the unknown, deathly afraid of the unknown. Why are children scared of the dark? Because they're scared of what they can't see. They're scared because they can't see under their bed. And they begin to imagine all of the monsters under their bed. By the way, kids, there aren't monsters under your bed. And by the way, adults, there aren't monsters under your bed. No need to fear the unknown. Oh, no doubt, no doubt, we have the safety and the security of the boat, and we know what's inside of our boats. But we also know what's outside of the boat, and that is Jesus Christ walking on the water. It's Jesus Christ walking on the water. I think this story isn't necessarily about, about our faith and Peter's faith, but it is about God's faithfulness. I, I, I remember, I remember throughout my life trying to figure out ways that I could stop myself from sinking. When I, had, when I too had stepped out of the boat, I've often thought to myself, how in the world can I stop myself, can, can, how, how can I stop myself sinking? Do I need to muster up more faith? Do I need to, do I need to simply try harder? I don't think that's the case at all. We don't see Jesus trying to make Peter try harder in the middle of him, in the middle of the storm when he, is, when he is sinking. No, instead, Jesus simply reached out his hands and he saved Peter, and that's what he does every single time. Pastor and author David Platt said, said this, if your eyes are on the wind, you will fail, but when your eyes are on Christ, when, when the all-sovereign, gracious, loving, merciful Savior and King of creation is the focus of your faith, you can always rest secure. Your faith will be constant because Christ is constant. We don't need to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps we don't need to begin to tread water. We need to fix our eyes firmly upon the love of God through Jesus Christ. That's how we become water walkers. 
we get out of the boat and keep our eyes fixed firmly upon Jesus. Let me tell you about a couple of water walkers here in the life of our church. We've got a water walker and his wife. He, he, um, he's an amazing guy. I think probably all of you know him. He's an amazing guy. Former Marine sergeant. He loves to go out. He loves to go out and visit homeless camps. Nobody, very, very few people know that he goes out and visits homeless camps. He brings them food and he brings them clothing. I've even seen him mentor a number of of folks who are really, really, really struggling in life. I've seen his wife call up our, call up our longest, longest uh, tenured member here at First Church. For weeks on end, Tiffany Davis called Wanda, and she would hold her phone up to her computer so Wanda could tune in. Dear sisters and brothers, that's what it's like to be a water walker. That's what it's like to do something for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's like when you step out in faith, wondering what's going to happen if you, if you go into these areas like Michael does, wondering how in the world he's going to protect us all every week like he does, wondering how he's going to be able to do all of the things that he does, the, all the things that he does, all the things that Tiffany does. These are water walkers right here in the life of our church. We have so many other people who are no longer sitting in the boat, safe and secure, yet very fearful of the unknown. No, these are people who step out of the boat, not relying upon their own skills when they begin to, when they begin to sink, but instead fix their eyes firmly upon Jesus Christ. You see, he's called each and every one of us to walk on the water. Again, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. You've got to get out of your safe and secure lives. You've got to get out there where you, know, where, you're not, where you don't have a fear of the unknown because you know what's on the other side out there, and that is the very embrace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come, jump out of the boat. Be like Peter jump out of the boat and walk on the water with the Lord. Would you bow with me?